Funding for Detroit Performs is provided by Masco Corporation is proud to manufacture innovative and environmentally friendly products for the home. Delta faucets, craft made in Marillat cabinets, and Bear Brand paints have all been designed with you in mind. Masco and its family of companies, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Funding is also provided by the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs and the National Endowment for the Arts and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Hello and welcome to Detroit Performs. I'm your host, DJ Oliver, and today we're at the Bajeski Gallery located inside the Ford Community and Performing Arts Center in Dearborn. Today's episode is all about overcoming obstacles. Our first segment features Stiggy's Dogs, an organization that trains rescue dogs to be service dogs for veterans. Check it out. Now if you guys will remember, we learned about Stiggy's dogs and what they were doing to help veterans, especially veterans who had served in Afghanistan or in Iraq. And we had learned about how they were taking animals from the Livingston County Animal Shelter and how they were pairing them with vets to make their lives a little bit better. I'm Beth Molnar and I teach um, English language arts and social studies to our team, Team Awareness. We teach fourth grade here at Navigator School. And Catherine Potoff and I teach the math and science to the entire team here at Navigator Upper Elementary School. Priscilla Homan uh, approached us about a 9-11 grant and so we got together over the summer, Catherine and I and Priscilla, and we came up with uh, a plan for the grant and, and we were granted the grant. And so uh, part of the grant was to make fanny packs for the veterans and bandanas for the dogs so that when the dog and the veteran were matched up, they would have something matching together. And um, the kids were really, really excited. The projects that the kids have come up for us, making the fanny packs, making the uh, bandanas, all of those things can be utilized, not just for our training for our veterans, but also it helps spread the word. Anything that gets people talking is a good thing. If my dog is wearing a bandana that says, I support Stiggy's dogs, or I love Stiggy's dogs, people want to know, what is Stiggy's dogs? Anytime I'm wearing a shirt, the same thing, I'm getting asked about it, what is Stiggy's dogs? So again, that all leads to education, and that really is the key. We are named in honor of our director's nephew, Benjamin Castiglione. He was killed in action in Afghanistan in 2009, and as a way to keep his legacy going and to continue to take care of his Marines, as they called them, we started Stiggy's Dogs. What we really do, the basic core and essence of us, is, is we rescue dogs from different shelters around the area, and we pair those dogs with veterans that have PTSD or TBI. So, you know, our motto is rescuing one to rescue another, and that is the truth of that. I love working with Pinckney Schools. This has been the third or fourth time that they have brought us back, and I really believe that you know education and perception starts with our youth, and they're just very patriotic here. They came up with this great idea about the fanny pack and bandanas, which work perfectly within our motto. Um, the fanny packs are great because we, when they first start training, you know they'll need them for some treats or to have do, you know doggy bags in them. We set from the very beginning a tone that we are involved with the community community service projects. Service learning is a huge aspect of our team, and so before we took on the project really with the students, we spent some time going over the website talking about Stiggy's dogs, and so we talked a little bit about what service dogs can do for humans. Our dogs are trained for a number of tasks. Uh, the biggest one obviously being the dog caring about the emotional state of their handler. That is a 24-7 job. They have to monitor that handler whether they're awake or asleep. And it really segued nicely into our our service project with Stiggy's dog. So the students were really invested right off the bat in thinking how can we help people who've given so much service to our country. It was a really nice fit. Anything with animals and, and especially dogs, there, there just seems to be this genuine draw to, to be an active participant. And it was really amazing to me that many of the children really took the time to plan out and, and really think about what they wanted to say. And we talked about how this is a gift 
to a veteran from you and it really needs to look nice and it really needs to mean something. It felt really special to make these for people who serve for our country. I hope it goes to someone good who needs one. Uh, they just have such a simple way of, of understanding and appreciating you know, what military and veterans do uh, or have done. So uh, just to see you know, their little hands you know, doing this little artwork and all these little pictures and the words they put on there, you, know, you wouldn't expect a lot of them to understand that, but they actually do. This is my bag and it says Stiggy's Dogs right here. It's got a little doggy bone and then doggy footprints and some stars and then on the top it says Thank you for your service. It has dog prints and um, USA and a bunch of stars. I don't know. I guess when I look at this, when I think of the students' artwork, <laughs> and I see little dog bones, and I see stars, and tiny little paw prints at the top, it makes me smile. And I guess if I were a vet and I'm reaching in every day for a little treat for my dog, I'll be thinking that some fourth grader made this for me. and. I guess you just can't help but feel good about this. I get, I get really teary when I think about it. It's just so sweet. And they really put time and energy into each one of their artworks that they did. And just seeing the pride that they had as they were showing them to us, um, I mean, that just fills my heart with joy. Oh, I love the bone. Look at that. Wow, beautiful. Children want to give. They want to feel like they're productive. They want to show how much they really truly care. And that's why we're here. We need to help them find ways that they can give back to their community. And I think art is an actual, pretty, pretty much an easy way for them to do that because really, I was pleasantly surprised how many children had artistic flair and ability. Um, I put a bone up here and for like the treats and stuff to go in. And like I put paw prints and I said, um, a man's best friend. This is my card. It says, thank you on the front. And then I put a flag. They really took some time and effort on the thank you cards to the veterans. So, um, I mean, that's another art, that's a different avenue for artistic expression. So the kids maybe that weren't as good as the, at the fanny pack <laughs> maybe did a really fine job on the, on the card that they made or vice versa. So it was, it was allowing that medium of art to come out in several different ways. It might start out as just something as, as simple art, but the meaning behind that and what it turns out to be was so much more. And you take this project, for example, we got to sit and talk with kids and they got to ask questions with our veterans and to touch these dogs and they got to learn about service dogs. So even though it was just an artwork, it, it transpired into so much more. I guess when we have it on the dog, um, I've had him with me all the time and I can see it all the time and I see what somebody's done and he's wearing it, it's just, it lets you know that you're not alone, you know, somebody else is, they understand why you have this dog and they understand the things you went through. For what our military do for us and the freedoms that we're, we're allowed in this country because of them is so important to instill in them, especially at this early age. Um, I think it's it, what makes our country great. I feel great giving stuff to people that once helped us in the Army, and I like, feel great giving them stuff back in honor. They may not fully understand PTSD, but understanding that there are people out there that need that extra bit of help. Um, you never know what a person's dealing with. I believe that art is a great therapy, and in trying to, like with service dogs, we're using that as one form of therapy. You know, there are all different alternative types, so seeing that the kids are doing this with art and seeing how that is also helping, I think that there's a great way to combine both. Thank you guys for bringing that awareness and making this come full circle. You know, spreading the word about what we've done, just a small project, maybe that will spur on other teachers to do service learning projects. There are so many things out there that you can do. You guys were so creative. Seriously, there were so many cool things. I, I just have tears in my eyes. This was wonderful. Believe it or not, thank you means so much to these veterans. It really does. Having, we'll be out training and somebody will come up and, oh, are you a veteran? And they'll say yes, oh, thank you for your service. And you can see this change come over them and, and the, the pride that they have that somebody took the time to recognize and to see children recognize it too. It's just awesome. Dear veterans, I want to say thank you for all 
of your service to our country. Thanks to you, I don't have to worry about anything bad happening to me in my country. I am grateful for how you have kept my country and me safe. Now I don't have to worry, your friend Bella. You can learn more about Stiggy's dogs as well as all the artists we feature on DetroitPerforms.org. Daryl Golston used to put details in his paintings and chalk drawings one only thought a photograph could duplicate. But it wasn't until after a fluke accident that he realized what his art was really all about. I tried to tell the story in my artwork. And when people uh, look at one of my art pieces, I want them to see something. I just don't want them just to see a picture. I want the uh, picture to kind of speak for itself. He uses a lot of colors to set the mood. He uses a black backdrop so the colors really pop. Uh, and so you really notice what he does with the art. It, you know, you can, you can see it, you can feel his emotion in it. I grew up in Detroit, Michigan. And I've always had a passion for um, drawing and just being creative. I grew up to be a um, figurative, uh, abstract artist, uh, watercolor. I tried to do a little bit of everything. And I just love uh, painting, I love the visual arts. Art has always been uh, uh, a part of my life and it's been a, a real strong hobby for me. Uh, I've been involved with um, helping others, you know, for years. And I've, um, I've been a director of different youth programs. I've been executive director of a community center. And I think that was the uh, main focus of my life. But art has always been a close second. And I was just kind of afraid to kind of uh, dive all the way into art and make a, a real 100% commitment to it. And since the accident, I decided that uh, I'm gonna really uh, concentrate on the art. And I think this is a second chance and a second opportunity to really do something that I truly love. Back in 2009, I was playing catch with a, um, one of the volunteers in the uh, community center. We got a little competitive throwing the ball back and forth and uh, the ball hit me um, right on the left side of my nose, which it broke my nose and broke my orbit. And I lost uh, sight over uh, a period of time. It was a gradual decline. My sight went down from um, probably 80% all the way down to 5% uh, in my right eye. In my left eye, I lost all the sight in my uh, left eye. And um, with my vision uh, impairment, what I've done is, um, I don't see that well, but I've been doing this so long that I um, talk to the kids and I get an opportunity to uh, tell them um, from the first time I sit down and meet with them is that you're going to have to help me and we're going to have to become um, as one. When he works with the, the youngsters at the community centers and, and when he teaches the art classes, uh, he's very passionate about uh, helping people to express themselves. And so um, it's fascinating to me because Regardless to the fact that he can't see, his, the vision is still there. I always ask the kids to draw big. And I think that's important for me to be able to see the images a little bit. And I walk around the classroom and I give the kids encouragement. And I say, well, you know, if I can't see it, then you can't feel it, okay? So I need you to make that contrast a little bit darker, you know, from the light. You know, just look at my face right here, and remember the, the, the uh, light source is coming down right here, and this part is real, real dark right here, okay? In his art, you know, he can explain. I, 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 honestly, I don't know how, because I don't know where I would be uh, if, if I lost my vision. My art started to change when I lost my sight uh, dramatically, because I was always uh, a detail artist. That was part of my style, and that's what I enjoyed doing. And when that happened, uh, I, didn't, I couldn't put the details in it, so I had to change my style. And you know, from there, I haven't uh, really done too much uh, visual art. And I decided to uh, really uh, change the art form, and I started to uh, concentrate on music a lot more. Now it seems 
I got into producing music back in the uh, 90s, so now I'm just completing my last project, and it's called uh, Listen to Love, and that's featuring uh, my wife, uh, Daisy Love, and I'm quite sure that uh, when people listen to the project, they're really gonna hear uh, where the love is coming from. Daryl is just a great producer. He, he puts together records really well. He knows his artists. He can get a lot of good things out of the artist when he's producing his records. When we go into the studio to record, um, he listens to the artist and he listens to your voice, he listens to the music, and he gets you to uh, understand what's going on in the changes of the music to bring it through vocally. Because I like the intensity that you come out of the, uh, the bridge, and when you start the vamp, that was really good. I've never worked with anybody like him. Um, he can exactly, he can give you exactly what he wants you to do. Yeah, and you, uh, right. you can you can do it. You know, you understand it. There's a difference between listening to music when you are um, a visual person as opposed to a person that's uh, visually impaired. When you're visually impaired, you uh, the music kind of consumes you and, and you hear all the little things that go on. I've detected a little bit more sensitivity to hearing certain anomalies in the music that, that maybe he didn't hear as quickly before. So uh, if there's a glitch in there, or there's a mistake or something like that, he tends to pick it up faster. Uh, I think he was a little bit behind with that. He has the ability to tap into the music and kind of guide you toward the direction you need to go in, you know, by tapping into you as a person. You know, most creative people have that intuitiveness about things, music or whatever. And, you know, once you click, I keep closing my eyes because it's, it's, it's what happens when you listen to music. I think I got a special connection with Daisy um, just because Daisy, I think, um, understands, she understands music. She's been doing this all her life. And Daisy is one of those uh, rare artists that you work with that is very um, coachable. You know, okay. so you want to keep it going and you want to keep that flow strong, okay? All right. Daisy all right. understood uh, the song because we wrote the song together. And we had a, um, a good time writing the song because we went back and forth in terms of uh, what does it mean to fall in love, you know? And I think the song is real personal to both of us. He had the surgery and so he's regaining his vision slowly. Uh, it was amazing to be there for the first day when they took the bandages off because his smile was huge. It was just the greatest feeling to be there for him, to see that and to see him regain it. And he's gaining it back slowly, a little more every day. Uh, over the, the time of six months, he'll be able to have, I'm hoping, roughly about 60% of his vision. And so I'm like anxious. I'm like, ooh, let's get you right back. We, we need to set up a corner so you can do your art. And you know, his music is his music. He can do that regardless, but I love to see him do what makes him happy, and his art is something that really, really makes him happy. I think um, me losing my sight has helped me find out who I am. You know, I might have lost my sight, but I gained my vision. Wow, this artwork is so cool, y'all, and all by Dearborn Public School students. What? Now, let's check out some upcoming events happening in and around the D.
Next up, a University of Michigan theater graduate turns his experience with a life-threatening illness into a new creative outlet for himself, as well as a way to help others facing the same intimidating journey. Here is my friend Alex Kipp and his play, My Other Voice. Alex, you have cancer. Every once in a while, you're in, you're in it, and you're going over the lines, and then you realize that this moment actually happened. We need to start him on a regimen of R-CHOP right away. Okay, English, What's please. What's that? R-CHOP's an acronym for rituximab, cyclophosphate. Cliff notes, please! It's chemotherapy. This isn't some abstract play written 100 years ago. Um, this happened a few years ago. The person it happened to is the author and in the room. We don't have much time. The tumor's growing. We need to start the steroids tonight and chemo in two days. Where well, he's very interested in telling a powerful story. We want to move you to the cancer wing tonight. Do you have any questions? No, no. I'm scared. We're going to take good care of you. He explains a story very well, but also brings in hope for everyone. I mean, it's not just a story of cancer that's really depressing. At the end of the day, it's really hopeful and exciting. Well, I've been doing theater since I was really young. Uh, it started in church, actually. Ever since then, I pretty much have always been doing it. I never expected to write a play. I don't even know who said it first. He sort of said, I, I want to write a play, and I said, you should write a play. And so it sort of started there, and he started bringing in scenes and started reading them, and it's been a really kind of amazing evolution. So I ended up going to the University of Michigan and I studied musical theater there. So everyone's plan after graduation is to sort of hit New York, you know, full force. We do this big showcase where we sing in front of all these agents. So my senior year, it's a big year when you're supposed to get ready for the showcase and all this stuff and you're singing all the time, but my voice was like completely failing. There's nothing like it. There's nothing like it in the world. This lovely feeling of being. What you're seeing. Obviously, you can't be singing in front of all these agents in New York City. So that's when we got some more tests and they found this big cloud, this dark cloud in my chest. And then they examined it more and realized it was a tumor. And then from there, realized it was non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Don't get worked up about it, just relax. We'll be back soon. And the expectation early on was, you know, all this is very treatable. We've seen a lot of people do really, really well in this treatment. You know, we're gonna do six rounds of chemotherapy. It's gonna be about six months. After that, you should be totally fine. We don't know if your voice will come back. Hopefully it will. Um, but you should be, you know, clear and good to go. I thought you said the pills were working. No, they're not working. Alex, you have to let me know if things aren't working. No, and then, you know, the six months rolls around, and at first they say, okay, everything's good, we're great. And then two weeks later I get a call, and they're like, actually, we found something that we missed. And you need to come back, and actually we need to do a stem cell transplant now. Which is when it really shifted for me, because then it was like really, really much more dramatic and much more life-threatening. We're basically rebooting the system. It's like hitting a restart button. We drain out the cancer, we put in healthy new stem cells, and they begin to reproduce and make new blood cells. And the thing about Alex is what I, uh, I just appreciate him, even as I've gotten to know him more, is that he's a fighter, that he you know, wasn't going to go down without a fight, no matter what news he was going to get, and he was going to live the life that he knew that he was created to live. Oh my god, what's going on? Oh, really? what, what did you do to him? For flags. There are scenes in the play that he didn't actually see. Um, one of the things that happened was realizing that people protected him from certain aspects of their experience, and yet wanting to honor those characters and go more deeply into that. So, for example, there's a moment where his mother really falls apart with his sister. There's a moment where his dad really falls apart with his best friend. You think it's easy watching my best friend die? God, he's not dying! You know, we know how it ends, but you know, when you're preparing a play, you want to make sure that the audience goes on that journey with you. It's like they're in the hospital room. 
right? They're dealing with this. It's like their son. It's like their dad, you know? It's, they feel like they're a part of this family. You're not gonna die, okay? Well, I think one of the things that's inspired me throughout this process is how honest Alex is in the telling of his story and how generous and I think when one's telling an autobiographical story, there's an impulse sometimes to make oneself seem a certain way. And he's been absolutely egoless in terms of letting go of any sense of how he might want to seem in order to tell the greater story and to think about how that story might serve patients and physicians and families and just the larger world. This is seriously torture. I don't even care anymore, okay? Oh, Mr. Kip, it could be a serious infection. It could be a collapsed lung. It could be a strain of a virus that's killing innocent small children. You know, because obviously it's based off my experience, but it's not word for word. Some of these characters are a combination of characters. Some of these characters didn't exist. So it's sort of like creating a world in which you can rectify what happened to show that there are really, you know, People who go through this, it can be a really debilitating thing, but it can also be a life-changing thing for the better. You know, I mean, in this play, the character changes into a better person, regardless if he lives or dies. We are treasured, we are sacred, we are blessed. Like, I feel like this is a play about cancer, but it's also a play about growing up, and a play about sort of having a different kind of wisdom about your role in the world and what truly matters. At the end, it brings everyone up, and um, I think shows it shows me, especially even being in it, what kind of person I want to be at the end of the day. We are treasured. We are sacred. We are. And that wraps it up for this edition of Detroit Performs. As always, for more arts and culture, head to DetroitPerforms.org, where you'll find featured videos, blogs, and information on coming arts events. Also, check us out on Facebook and Twitter. I'd like to thank the Majeski Gallery for letting us tour their exhibition here today. Until next Tuesday, get out there and show the world how Detroit performs, y'all. I'm DJ Oliver. Thanks for watching, guys. Funding for Detroit Performs is provided by Masco Corporation is proud to manufacture innovative and environmentally friendly products for the home. Delta faucets, craft made in Marillat cabinets, and Bear Brand paints have all been designed with you in mind. Masco and its family of companies, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Funding is also provided by the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs and the National Endowment for the Arts and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.